Um, morning, yes, as, as Tom said, my name is Carl. Um, I'm married to Lisa. We have three lovely children. Two that aren't so lovely, but we don't talk about them. No, we've just got the three. Um, and uh, so on, on our wedding day, um, as a tradition, as the groom, um, it was my job to give a speech. And the job of the groom generally is to say thank you to everyone that's been involved in the wedding. And this starts off fairly easy, thanks to the person that drove us here, thanks to the person who did the seats, flowers, etc. And then it gets increasingly more difficult as you go along. So by the end of the speech, um, you get to thanking the in-laws. Now, I have wonderful in-laws, no mother-in-law jokes here. Um, and it's pretty hard to say thank you to them for how welcoming they'd been to me into Lisa's family. And then it gets on to my own parents. And I am very blessed to have wonderful earthly parents. And I'm supposed to say in a few sentences, thank you for everything they've done for me, feeding me, clothing me, giving me these wonderful good looks. Um, <laughs> And I've got to get that in two or three sentences. And if that's not hard enough, my final job as the groom on that day is to describe how beautiful my wife looks. Um, I'll tell you what I said on that day. This gets a bit soppy. But a few months before we got married, me and Lisa ran a marathon together. And at the end of the race, she was kind of, I looked back, she was sort of a bit stumbly, face was red, hairs like splattered to her forehead with sweat. And she'd about... Uh, five minutes before that, thrown some jelly babies at me that she didn't want. Um, and I have no words to describe how beautiful she looked in that moment. So how am I supposed to describe how beautiful she looked on our wedding day? Um, I'm writing a book on charm, so I'll, I'll emphasize that afterwards. Um, now, as wonderful as my wife and parents are, these are human relationships. Um, and they're hard enough to describe. But what about when we come before almighty God? You know, the God that we've been singing to this morning, the creator of everything, our loving father who didn't even spare his own son. How are we supposed to know or even start with the words to say how thankful we are to him? Um, and partly, the truth is, we never will. We will never fully express how wonderful God is. We will never properly say thank you for all he has done for us. But it it still can be very overwhelming to know where to start. But God hasn't left us to our own devices. He has given us the Psalms. Um, there was a 4th uh, century writer called Athanasius um, who said that the Psalms are unique because while the rest of the Bible speaks to us, the Psalms speak for us. Um, and that's why we, uh, every year, usually around this time as Redeemer, we do a series on the Psalms. Because the Psalms is a book of songs and poems that covers the whole range of human experience and emotion. And it gives us a great starting point when we come before God to express how we're feeling. Because chances are, however you are feeling this morning, there is a psalm to express that and turn your eyes to God. Um, there's songs of great joy, songs that tell stories of God's faithfulness, um, songs um, that tell of great struggles, which is kind of the one we're on today. Um, it's all in there. Um, and so we're going to spend in the next few weeks, interspersed with the odd guest speaker and uh, family service, looking at some of the songs and poems contained in this remarkable book and how they help us relate to God. Um, so we're doing Psalm 13 this morning, as I believe Tom already said. Um, this is a psalm that was written by King David. Uh, the circumstances he wrote it in are unclear, um, but as will become obvious, he was definitely going through a very difficult time. Um, he could have been fighting you know, human enemies. He was a king. He had a kingdom to defend. He fought many wars. Um, he could have been dealing with family issues. Um, he had a very difficult family, lots of sons. One of them outwardly rebelled against him. Um, and he could have been dealing with sickness. We know towards the end of his life he did get sick. Um, and we will all have experienced situations like this. Probably all got something this morning we can think of. Some of us are sick. We have physical issues. Um, some of us are dealing with stress at work, whether that's relationships or the amount of work that we have to do. We'll all have family issues. Even if you don't feel it personally, you don't have to scroll far down a news feed to start to think, God, what is going on in this world? And I'm hoping that as we go through the psalm, um, what David has to teach us through this psalm will be a great encouragement to us in these difficult times and give us some um, 
helpful ways to deal with that. Um, it's quite a short psalm, six verses. Let's read through it now. Um, how long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. So there's quite a simple structure here. Um, we've got two verses at the beginning of uh, lament, which is just a fancy word for crying out to God, talking about the struggles that David is going for. Then he moves into two verses of more requests, asking God for things, deliverance. And then he finishes off with two verses of praise and worship. So starting off in verse 1, we see some, some pretty strong language. Sometimes a lot of what we read in the Psalms, you think, oh, you can't say that to God. But David does, and hopefully we'll learn later it's okay. Um, but he starts off, how long, Lord, will you hide your face from me? Now, countless times in the Bible, God promises that he will never leave us or forsake us. But I'm sure we've all experienced times when that promise is quite hard to take hold of, when it feels like God has turned away feels like he's abandoned us or he's not listening to our prayers. And this can often lead us inwards, um, as it does with David. So in verse 2 we read, How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? Which suggests an internal struggle. Um, you know, he's, he's dealing with these things by himself and that leads him to question, How long will my enemy triumph over me? David had literal enemies, as I've already said. He was king of Israel. He fought actual battles. He had people to defeat, enemies trying to invade Israel. But he also had a spiritual one. And we have the same spiritual enemy. Satan wants to triumph over us. And he loves it when we wrestle with our thoughts on our own. Because that's his only hope. If we are looking inwards, trying to deal with our situations, then Satan has a chance. But if we are looking to God, if we are filling our minds and our hearts with God's truth and God's word, then Satan doesn't stand a chance. Because all he has are lies. That is his only weapon. And God's truth will always defeat Satan's lies. And that's why David doesn't spend too long wrestling with his thoughts. He turns to God. As we've heard several times through the worship, he looks to him. Um, and we, we see this in verse 3. Look on me and answer, Lord my God. David doesn't want to wrestle with his thoughts alone. Um, he wants to talk to God about them. He says, give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. David knows that his only chance of getting through this situation lies with God. And we, you can read a lot. Um, kind of online or wherever you go for help about mindfulness, um, breathing techniques and all sorts of things to deal with difficult situations. But they, whatever the solution you see outside of the Bible, all share the same flaw. It's all about looking inwards. 3,000 years ago, David had the answer. The answer, his answer, is to take it to God first. How often do we leave that till last? How often do we try as much as we can by ourselves and then go, well, that didn't work. I better go to God now. Um, but then in verse 5 and 6, we get quite a dramatic shift in tone. Um, we go from the line, I will sleep in death, to I will, sorry, lost it. I will trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. Now, the first time I read this when I was preparing, it almost feels like verse 5 and 6 have been put in the wrong psalm, like it's a translation error, or someone found two parts of the same scroll and just went, yep, stick them together, don't need to check that. Um, but this is where we get to the real important thing, the, um, the, the real answer in how David is dealing with these situations. This reveals the reason that David goes to God first. 
It's not a last ditch attempt to solve his problems because everything else has failed. He is expressing why God is the answer. You know, he says that he trusts in his unfailing love. Quite a strange statement, given what he's already gone, talked about in the first four verses of the psalm. He talks about his heart rejoicing in, your, in his salvation. Now, the first four verses of the psalm do not talk about, you know, that's difficult. He's not been rescued, but he's then talking about God's salvation, God's rescue. He says, I will sing of the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. Not the words of the man in the first four verses. You know, he's talking about how hard life is, but then switches to how good God has been to him. Now, I, I, I saw, saw two ways of reading these verses. Perhaps he's talking to some friends. So perhaps he's got people around him who are going, why are you still trusting in God? Look, at, look around, like he's abandoned you. And maybe David is going back to them. But maybe he's also just talking to himself. Worship is, is obviously directed to God. We are proclaiming who he is and what he has done. But it is also a helpful reminder to us of what he's done. Um, and this is what helps David in his times of trouble. He's laid his troubles out. He's asked God to take them away. But ultimately, he ends in a place of worship, reminding himself that God can be trusted, that God has the answer, whatever the circumstances. So what about us? Now, I am guessing none of you are fighting an army with a neighboring country. Um, can't help you with that. Um, but let's look about whatever it is. We've all got difficult situations. We'll all have stuff in our lives, lives of people close to us, things we're seeing in the news, things we're seeing in the world around us that are leading us to think that God has turned his face from us. Let's see what Psalm 13 can teach us about how we respond in difficult circumstances. First of all, God wants you to be angry. Secondly, he wants us to take it to him. And then finally, we must worship. Now, God wants you to be angry. That sounds strange, probably. It did to me. Um, I, read a, uh, I was reading a book recently um, by Phil Moore, and there's a chapter about, you know, is it okay to be angry to God? And his conclusion was yes. Um, and that's a, that's a strange thing to us. Um, but David, frequently in the Psalms, says some pretty shocking things to God. You know, this, the stuff in this psalm is actually quite tame compared to some of the others. Um, Jesus got angry. We read in Matthew chapter 21, Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money chain, changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The Bible talks about God himself getting angry. I've um, got a few examples that will come up. But we read, God is a just judge, and God is angry with the wicked every day. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken, because he was angry. For the great day of his anger, or wrath, has come, and who is able to stand? There are things in this world that displease God, and they should displease us too. It should make you angry that there are children in this country that go to sleep hungry every night. It happens all over the world. It should make you angry. It should make you angry that there are people still being sold as slaves, that women are abused by their husbands every day all over the world. It should make us angry that Naomi Green has cancer. It should make us angry that billions of people in this world are lost and in need of Jesus, and as things stand, they are going to hell. These things make God angry, and they should make us angry too. Now, this is quite an unnatural thing for us to do. I think part of it relates to, what, um, to Rachel's word that Tom mentioned. It's difficult to go to God with the mess. We feel like... I should get all this off my chest. I should calm down and go to God, put together, well presented, um, and calmly. Um, and um, kids are great for this. Um, sorry to mention, I've got three. And, you know, after dinner, my two-year-old, he doesn't come into the kitchen to get his... He doesn't wash, you know, wipe his face, wash his hands, and then come to me and say, 
Daddy, can you clean me up? He comes into the kitchen, face plastered with tomato sauce, just, come on, clean me. Um, and that's how God wants us to approach him. You know, he wants us to just take it to him. So I actually want, I'm going to pause now, and I'd actually like us to, we don't often make time um, in, in, in corporate worship for this. And I'd like us to, to just take a couple of minutes. Let's cry out to God about the things that are troubling us. Be honest with God. Don't think about requests. We will come to that. But just be honest about how you're feeling about your job, how you're feeling about that family member that's ill or your family member that doesn't know Jesus, the cost of living crisis, the political instability, the wars that are all around us. If you feel like he's hidden his face from you or he's forgotten you, let's tell him now. Now, it's, it's good to be, to be angry, to be honest with God, but we are not to just leave it there. This is not me saying, have a good vent at God and then go about your life. Um, there is a healthy way for us to deal with this, um, which is where we move on. We must take it to God. Um, now, you've all just done that, so well done. You're a step ahead. Um, but this is not, we can take it to God if we want to. So I often say to my kids, if they're a bit upset, I'd be like, you don't have to talk to me about this now, but you should talk to somebody about it. Um, But we must take it to God. Like, whatever you are feeling, it could be that you're feeling happy, take that to him as well. But whatever we are feeling, we must take it to God. I don't believe God is happy with us being angry in general, or being angry about him, or being angry about the world around us. But I do believe that he's happy if we are angry towards him when we go to him with what is troubling us, when we go to him with our fear and with our anger. It's good to be honest about our feelings with ourselves. It's good to talk to the people around us, but that will only get us so far. We have to be honest with God. If we want things to change, he is the person to go to. First of all, it just makes sense. If you've got a problem, the best person to speak to is the person most able to help you. Now, I was once upon a time first aid trained. I think it expired five years ago. So if you broke your leg, are you going to come and speak to me about it? Or are you going to go to the hospital and speak to a doctor? No one's looking too sure about my skills. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go with, the, with hospital. Now, if in the midst of your struggles, you have, what if you had access to an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving being who has created everything you see around you and everything that has existed and will exist and is interested in every aspect of your life. Would make sense to go to that person with whatever is troubling you. And we do have access to that sort of person. God wants to help you. God has the power to help you. There is nothing beyond him. There is nothing he will hold back, as Tom's already mentioned. He's given us his most precious possession, his son. He also has the wisdom, this is where things get a bit tricky, to know what is best for us. So what I'm not saying is that whatever you want, whatever you need, God will sort it for you. God will, actually, sorry, not whatever you want, but he will give you what you need. We don't know what that is sometimes, but God does. 
That's where things are tricky. You know, sometimes it would be nice if God sorted that situation straight away. But he won't always do that. We have to trust that that is him in his infinite wisdom, way beyond anything we can imagine, doing what is best for us. He promises in his Bibles, he knows the plans he has for us, plans to prosper us and not to harm us. And that can be hard. I'm not, this isn't a, a sermon where I say, all your problems are going to be solved and it's going to be easy. But God is working for, the, for your best. We'll come back to that in a minute. Secondly, being honest with God builds intimacy. The more on it, God, God wants to know how we're feeling. He already knows, but he wants us to be honest with, with him. You know, the closer your human relationships are, the more honest you can be with that person. God wants to hear about what is on your heart. He wants to know what is troubling you. The more we are honest with him, the closer we will draw to him. The more honest we are with him, the less likely it is to feel like he has forgotten us or like he has turned his face away from us. Because so often we think, God, why have you turned away from me? Why have you forgotten me? When actually it's us. In fact, it's always us. (laughs) We've turned away from him. We've got angry, maybe for good reason, but we've got angry and we've turned away from God. We haven't gone to him first. So God is happy with us being angry. He expects it. He wants us to be angry. There's things that should make us angry. He wants us to take it to him first. But this is not an excuse to vent. I've already said that. And it is definitely not our chance to go to God and say, God, this is what's troubling me. This is what you need to do about it. And David finishes the psalm by worshipping. Already said, it's a very strange shift as we go from verse 4 to verse 5. Um, Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5 to give thanks in all circumstances. And this shift in verse 5 to David talking about God's unfailing love, God's salvation, um, God's faithfulness, despite everything he's just been talking about in the first four verses, is David putting this into action. Uh, Another piece of earthly wisdom is that whatever we are dealing with, we should always look for the positive, look for the the silver lining to every cloud. And God is our ultimate silver lining. That is what David is turning to here. He's going, "What what is the positive in every circumstance? God. Worship shows submission. We can't truly worship God when we can't really properly consider who he is and everything he's done and then switch to telling him what he needs to do, what our solution to the problem is. It's also very difficult to truly comprehend how great God is and then feel completely hopeless about every situation. Not easy, not saying that, but it gets a lot easier. The more you sing your name is the highest, the more you think, yeah, God is above this. The more you sing, holy forever, the more you think God is not getting tired, God is not going away, he is still there. Because when we worship, as I've already said, we we are singing these things to God, but we are also proclaiming them to ourselves. Um, It's a bit like a compliment. If I tell my wife she's a good cook, then obviously... That's to tell her something nice. But it's also to remind her to me, oh yeah, she is a good cook. That meal she cooked last night, that was great. And now I'm looking forward to dinner more. I know that the next meal I get is equally likely to be delicious. (laughs) Silly example, but you know, as when we we sing that God loves us, it's a reminder, yeah, he does. And maybe we'll wrestle with that for a little bit. We start to search for reasons. Why is that true? Does God love me? When we say, how great is our God? We think, oh yeah, how great is God? He did this. Look at the world around me. When we sing of his faithfulness, we remember that we've been through times like this before, probably. And we remember that we got through those. Whether that was because God took it away and the situation stopped, or because it carried on being hard and it's still hard, but God drew close to us. And we felt his love in those circumstances.
Now, David sings of three very specific things in this psalm. He sings of God's love, he sings of God's faithfulness, and he sings of God's salvation. Now, when David wrote this, God's salvation was dependent on animal sacrifices. But for us, God's salvation has been bought by Jesus. Jesus is the best evidence we have for these three things. God's faithfulness, God's love, and our salvation. Jesus himself could have sung the words from this psalm. He chose other psalms, but he could have sung this one. You know, when he hung on the cross, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He felt like God, God had, that was the only time God has ever turned his face away from someone he loved. He turned his face away from Jesus. Jesus went through that. It looked like the enemy had triumphed. But Jesus turned his eyes towards God and he said, not my will, but yours. He submitted to the will of his father. He said, I know that this needs to happen. And he did it for you. Yes, it was a God's salvation plan for all of humanity, but it was always a very personal thing. Maybe you've never thought about taking struggles to God before, whether that's because you don't think you should or because you've just never thought about taking anything to God before. But because Jesus died for you, you can. We can be assured that God is listening we can be assured, as Tom said, that he wants to help us, that he will use all his power to do so because he gave us his son. He didn't hold anything back. That was the ultimate difficult situation. We were slaves to sin. The enemy was triumphing over us. And God gave us Jesus. And if that's not enough... After defeating death, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead and showed that God can overcome anything is in you. That same power is in you right now. Or if you've not accepted Jesus before, it can be. Whatever you are facing, God can do it because he has overcome a lot worse. He can overcome this, perhaps in a surprising way, perhaps not in the way we, we are, if we're honest, would like him to, but he can overcome it. You know, this is why he doesn't care about the mess, because he's fixed the mess. He's cleaned it. It's all dealt with. He's got the cloth ready. It's done. You know, we can go to him, face covered in metaphorical pasta sauce and say this is this is me Jesus I need your cleansing and if you've never done that before then please come and speak to us at the end you know if you've never taken your struggles to God then do it this morning come to him and say I need your salvation Lord um, can I get the, the band to come up going to respond now i think first of all let's 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 take ourselves to the first four verses of that psalms let's be go back to that place of being honest with god as the band starts to play let's cry out to god for help lay your difficult situations before him whatever is troubling you however difficult take it to god ask him to stop that situation i'm not saying that we go before god and and say whatever you want. We can tell him what we want to happen, but we have to take that in a submissive, but I know you know best, God. We have to be ready for a different answer. So let's ask God to heal our family members. Let's ask God to heal ourselves, to suddenly make that difficult person at work really easy to work with, to suddenly take away whatever family conflict you have. Um, let's stand if we're able to. Let's do that now. Lord, I thank you 
that you want us to be honest with you about how we feel. Lord, we come before you now and we cry out to you, Lord. This is what is troubling us. Just cry out to God now. Tell him what's on your heart. Tell him what's making you angry. Tell him what's making you afraid. Tell him what is making you anxious. now ask him to work in those situations call out for God's power to heal to mend to set free cry out for his salvation God doesn't care about us coming to him messy but he does care about the mess and he wants to clean it up but he will do that for us we don't need to do it by ourselves Now let's finish with worship. Let's lay down our requests at God's feet. Remind ourselves that what we've just asked for is possible. And that God has the wisdom to know what needs to be done. He will work whatever we are facing for our good. So that at the end of our laments, and are crying out for God's help, we can say like David did, Lord, I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. We will sing the Lord's praises, for he has been good to us.